Welcome to part one of our rotary engine build series presented by Valvoline. Pow, pow. it everyone this is our 13b rew two rotor motor out of our fdrx7 and it's out of there for a reason it's uh it's broken we don't know exactly what's wrong but internally there are problems with it which is uh, why we've got such a great deal on that car because we knew we'd have to get into an engine rebuild so at this point you're just looking at what is a core for a rebuild some of the parts will get reused some won't as you'll see as we move along in this engine build series so our goal here is to obviously get it mounted on this stand which we've just done by removing some things that you've just seen and you may have also noticed we used a custom bracket to mount it to the stand. That is like a rotary specific style bracket that I borrowed from our rotary engine building friend who will be by shortly. So we'll, you'll learn more about him soon. In the meantime, we're going to continue to prep this and really just strip it down to a bare short block. So we're going to remove, you know, all these accessories, get it ready for short block disassembly, at which point we'll really discover what the problem is on the inside. We're going to start the process off here by removing the sequential turbocharger system on this engine which is pretty unique and pretty complex too. It, this, uh, by the way, I should mention our car is a 1993 JDM import right-hand drive car. So if this is the original engine in that car, then this would be a 93 version as well. We have no way of knowing that, at least I don't have a way of knowing it. Maybe our engine builder will know from some stampings, but we're going to assume that this is out of a 93. And man, what a complex system it is. It has four of these actuators and solenoids and all these vacuum lines and pressure lines, which are used to control these two turbochargers. The smaller of the two, which comes on around 1800 RPM and it's gonna give you that initial boost. And then the, the second one comes on at 4000 RPM and, and gives you boost pretty much to red line. So they're designed to give you like a much broader power band uh, by virtue of the way they, they're staged in. So it's a, it's a really cool setup, but they're also not very reliable because all these vacuum lines and pressure lines and stuff are, are, they tend to fail because they're exposed to so much high heat. Rotaries themselves run really hot and you're right next to two turbochargers. The amount of heat that all this is exposed to is going to lead to some reliability issues. So, oh man, look at that everybody. What a beast this thing is. This weighs a lot. Our, uh, our FD just got lighter. <laughs> Here's the tiny little exhaust manifold. You ever seen an exhaust manifold this small before? It's, it's kind of hilarious. And here you can see how the, this uh, like block off, I guess you could call it, has an actuator underneath it that opens at the specified RPM. Taking off the last nut here for the, oh, and dropping it for the intake tube here, which is made of like this EBS style plastic and look at the unique shape of that throttle body intake area boy is it oily in there too pete look at the oil in there Ooh, yes. that is nasty interesting looking at the throttle body here as i just start to tip into the throttle you can see the lower one cracks open first comes open about i don't know 15 20 percent and then the top ones come in afterwards so it's it's like a staged throttle body system here which it's got a really complex uh, intake manifold system too so we'll show you more of that in a second it's popping off the upper intake manifold here and oh we still have something plugged in no no it's just snagged on something and uh, it's an interesting little piece, isn't it? And obviously it feeds into the lower intake manifold here and there's a whole bunch of stuff that lives under here. The coil uh, pack stuff is under here as well. More vacuum lines, all part of that like infamous rat's nest setup that we're gonna be cleaning up tremendously. And there are of course aftermarket options for upper and lower intake manifolds. So stay tuned for what we're doing there. Lower intake manifold coming off and 
as you can see, there's lots of stuff going on here with those small central runners and then the larger outer runners. Interesting to look here too and see your primary fuel rail. This little tiny guy here is your fuel rail, your Eclipse here, and you can see that they feed these two smaller ports here. So again, that goes back to the idea of the, the smaller primary injectors helping with like tipping and cruising, you know, light load. And then when you really get on it, you get into boost, you need more fuel. Well, that's when you go to your secondary fuel rail, which is living on that, that manifold we just removed, which m with much bigger injectors, which feed these much bigger ports. So man, these things are thirsty. They use a lot of fuel and they produce a lot of heat as well. So you can see they're packing a lot into a very small area. I mean, this is a 1.3 liter engine, technically speaking. So to make the kind of power that these things do out of such a small package requires a lot of fuel and a lot of airflow. There we have it. That is our 13B short block and it is down to its bare essentials. And in case you're wondering why it's, why it's called a two rotor, well, you got one rotor in here, you got another rotor in there. Two rotors gives you 1.3 liters of displacement. Add a third one and you guys can do the math to figure out the displacement on it, but that's of course called a 20B. A fourth one would make you a 26B, which is like that race car 787 motor or you know what the crazy guys in New Zealand like to build. But we're sticking with two rotors because we're gonna make plenty of jam with these. All right, everybody, Joe Ferguson is here. He is our rotary guru, has been for many years now. Yep. Joe knows me for so long that I didn't have gray hair when we, uh, when we <laughs> met, so it's been a minute. Yeah. In fact, you helped us with a couple of rotary videos back in the day. Yep. You built an RX-8 engine, mm -hmm. and then you built Ken's yep. Bridgeport FD yep. engine. Bridge, Bridgeport motor, yeah. So uh, you've built, I don't know, how many rotary I, I don't even know. Would it be in the hundreds? Hundred, probably, maybe more. Yeah, I'm sure of it. So say, suffice it to say, he knows his rotaries. We've tripped it down to the short block, and uh, Joe brought a couple of special tools that'll help us take it apart. The first of Joe's medieval tools here for a rotary disassembly. You, yeah. you made this yourself, I oh, guess? Oh yeah, I probably made this when I was like 14 back home on the farm with a <laughs> stick welder. Like It this. looks sort of farm grade, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I, and I also made this too. This is the, the crank pulley or uh, crank bolt uh, uh, tool. This was farm parts. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it worked for many years. Couldn't afford any snap-on tools back then when I was young, so this is what I did. And 20 years later, it's still working still well. Still working, so. why not? Oh yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh yeah. It came, wow. it came loose. That wasn't too bad. This engine may have been a part in its not too distant past. Maybe. We know nothing about it. The first rookie mistake Joe's calling us out on is not draining the block properly. Yeah. So the engine block still, even though you've pulled it out of the car and water pumping everything off and probably a bunch of coolant is built out, there's always going to be probably like a liter or more of, of coolant sitting in the bottom of the block. So this little drain right here, actually this bolt, is actually an engine block drain. So. So there you go. Oh yeah, that is a lot. Now imagine you tip the motor up on its yes. face. All this is going straight out the front and all over the floor. And we're lucky we didn't do that when we were mounting it on the stand. Actually, <laughs> so jumping back over to where you remove the crank pulley—is that yep. what we call that? Crank pulley, the, yep. The e shaft pulley. Yes. If we want to be yes. technically accurate. Yeah. And there's like a little stub axle in here. What would you call this? Yeah. This is, well, this is the this is just what drives your accessories. Um, but with with that that single 19 millimeter uh, nut that, or bolt that goes in the center here that tightens the, the front stack together on, under this front cover. And uh, once you release that, and when you go to pull this out, yeah. now, the, now the, whole, the whole assembly can oh, wow. move back and forth. So that's actually the E-shaft or the crankshaft moving back and forth yes. in, in the Yeah, pump. the whole thing. Cool. All right, Joe's just uh, blasted the bolts off of the pressure plate here and we're gonna get a look at the clutch, which is always a fun thing to see. There we go. And actually, it doesn't look bad, does no. it? No, it looks all right. It doesn't look like it's been heat stressed terribly. Yeah. It's not like mega worn out. 
So our first piece of detective work. Yep. You've spotted some things here that aren't quite right. That, that aren't the way they should be. <laughs> so right away, there is a bunch of white, I don't even know what this is, sealant, uh, thread locker yeah. or something that they put on there. That is not normal. And the second thing I noticed right away is that this nut is actually installed backwards. So that's your, there's that, you can kind of see there's actually like an integrated like washer. Like yes. there's how that round thing goes around there. Yes. So that should actually be sitting and, and that would make a lot of sense. Face down on the flywheel. And uh, <laughs> so this is backwards. So wow. it probably damaged the flywheel. Like, oh, look at that. Yeah, did the job. Nice. There we go. Like those, yeah. And we're not going to use this flywheel. No, so I wasn't too. Tap. I wasn't too worried about uh, right. about hitting it. So, oh wow! Oh wow! They Check that the out. Rear main seal came off with the flywheel. <laughs> that is truly pathetic. Holy! I've never seen a seal come out like that. There you go. But when we were looking down behind the flywheel, we could see it was kind of like just barely in there. Next step is to remove the oil pan. So uh, Joe stepping in here with the old uh, chisel and hammer. Mm -hmm. See if we can get this loose. Oh, there we go. No, not too bad actually. Yeah. Look at all the RTV. Oh. Moving on to the front cover here. Joe's just blasting a few of the bolts out. Okay. So underneath the front cover, you can see we've got the front stack here, including the oil pump. So there's your oil pump. Well, it looks like we found some pretty conclusive evidence that this motor has in fact been rebuilt, yeah. haven't we? Yeah, totally, yeah. So there's, first of all, there's these uh, aftermarket frost plugs that have been put in here. These mm -hmm. actually- Made in the USA. Made in the USA, and yeah. Uh, yeah, that's definitely aftermarket. I mean, the factory Mazda ones don't have any markings on them. Uh, the tension bolts here, these are basically their head studs. They've actually got numbers on them. Someone sharpied numbers on them, and you, builders will do that so that, because there's a process, uh, like a, a, a certain order to, to torque them down. Mm -hmm. So it's easy just to number them, follow the numbers. So, right. I mean, clearly this thing's been apart. So, I mean, could, could be good, could yeah. be really the bad. The mountain of sealant didn't tip us off. <laughs> this, this definitely yeah. is a yeah. conclusive evidence. So uh, sure. Joe's gonna blow up the stack now and we will take a look at it once it's fully disassembled. <laughs> It, everyone I think it's safe to say that this engine design is truly original that's right everyone I just said the word original which means it's time for a Valvoline original motor oil moment did you know that dr. John Ellis discovered the lubricating benefits of crude oil and founded the company that became Valvoline in 1866 I did know that Peter because I'm extremely smart and I also know that that made Valvoline the very first trademark motor oil in the world. Well there you have it everyone, now let's get back to the rotary engine building action. Well Joe, it's interesting taking a look at this now that it's apart. There's a lot of uh, sad news I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some, there's some issues. There are some issues, yeah. maybe we should start yeah. with the... Uh... We'll start from the back here. Okay. So, First off, when we pulled this rear iron off, um, we noticed the bearing showing a ton of copper on one side. You see that sometimes in motors you pull apart. They still have good oil pressure, they work. The oil, uh, the bearing hasn't spun, but uh, that indicates excessive wear. Something not, not going on right with uh, either, either the center shaft or the way the bearing was installed. So uh, yeah, next up is the rotor. Now uh, we noticed some damage here on the face. As you can tell, Yeah. some imprints of Foreign debris, seal, seal material, <laughs> seals or something, and yeah. then even the apex seal um, groove here has a—it's really wide right there. Bent. Something's broken or bent, and actually, there's a real shiny edge right here. It's yeah. been rolled over before. Yeah, um, that's probably the worst part of that rotor. Uh, this one looks pretty, pretty good. Okay yeah, okay to the to the eye. Oh, that one's kind that, of wide open on that. Yeah, end. that one's wide, and then there's actually a, a nick in this oh, end yeah. as well. Yeah, so is this garbage at this point or is it something we can reuse? I wouldn't use this in an engine rebuild. Okay. Obviously whoever built this motor did because 
if it has all this damage, but yet all the seals were intact, how did it get damaged? Yeah, <laughs> so he's reused damaged. I motors. think these were damaged from a previous engine explosion or, or, or an issue, and they just uh, put new seals in and put the motor back together. Hope for the best, but yeah. we don't want to do that. And now for what are quite possibly the most scored motor yeah. housings I've ever seen. They look pretty bad for being what looks to be a rebuilt motor. <laughs> yeah, again, it's a case of like they rebuilt it and it's almost like, did they machine it that rough? Right, it kind of it kind of looks like it. It looks like they tried to either resurface the chrome face <clears throat> with sandpaper or a honing tool of some sort, but mm -hmm. uh, it obviously went really bad for them. <laughs> Normally, this should be a perfectly smooth, yeah, high yeah. shine chrome and, finish. Yeah, yeah chrome and, this has chrome and shiny. And scoring in it. Yeah. And you were saying too that the uh, this black mark above the, mm -hmm. uh, the so port. So this so this black mark on here, right above the exhaust port, uh, that to me would tell <clears throat> where it's really worn in the center here. That's a high spot. So this is either warped or the surface that something's gone on here where the apex seal as it travels up here, it actually is bumping off, not touching the surface anymore. So you're getting blow by right there right away. Mm -hmm. And then and then where it uh, returns, obviously it's uh, everything's back to kind of uh, sealing again. Sealing. So, yeah, yeah. So something something's going on there. It's yeah, not, not, not straight pretty. flat. No. And the other one is just as bad. It is scored really yeah. badly too. So. These are basically garbage at this point. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't reuse them. No. So we've got garbage housings. We've got garbage rotors. Yeah. We've got destroyed bearings. But the irons themselves, like the surface on the irons, are yeah. pretty decent. Aren't they? <clears throat> yeah, the irons actually look to be pretty good. Um, typically, you find a lot of uh, step wear mm -hmm. uh, on the opposite side of where the uh, the intake ports are, and these aren't bad. Yeah, you can see there's a yeah. little bit of a line there, but you can't really even feel no. it on the surface. So. No. I mean, we could we could dial indicate that and just to see what the step wear is, but. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Potentially, the irons could be reused. I, I would, I would measure them and make sure that there's nothing funny going on. But from from looking at these, though, I would probably reuse these. Last but not least, mm -hmm. the myth, the mythical E shaft, mm -hmm. eccentric shaft, as they call it. Basically, it's the equivalent of a crankshaft. Crankshaft. Isn't it? Yep. And uh, it's not looking all good here either, is no, it? No, no. Going back to that rear bearing, you can actually see in the the rear journal here. You can see these two uh, really badly worn spots. Now, if you spin it around goes away goes away mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know that to me indicates that th this could be bent this out rear of, yeah out of yeah true yeah and that would that would explain the accelerated wear on the on those bearing mm -hmm. on that rear bearing so so is this something that can be machined <clears throat> true or is this uh, uh, a paperweight I'm sure some machinists might be able to, to machine but you know what the, these are so cheap I just I just get a, a known good one all right everyone that is a wrap on this 13b disassembly and I, I want to say I feel good about it, but it's kind of sad that we're not going to be able to reuse some of the parts we were hoping to reuse. We were yeah. hoping to reuse the E-shaft and the rotors. Yeah. Yeah. We, we already have plans for the rest of the motor, so we're not too concerned about mm -hmm. those parts of the motor, mm -hmm. but we have some thinking to do about the E-shaft and the rotors themselves, so we're going to go away and think about that. And in the next episode, you will see us start to put this all back together again with some pretty trick stuff, so stay tuned for that. And let's not forget, guys, that we have to say a very big thank you to Valvoline for supporting this engine build and making it all possible. As a matter of fact, if you'd like more information on their product or just some really cool DIY tech content, make sure you check out team.valvoline.com. There's even some content on there from Pete and I, some recent stuff that I've provided in uh, their blog, as well as some uh, videos that we've produced for them in previous years. So go check that all out. You can learn more about how to change your oil, how to change your brakes, how to do all kinds of cool stuff, as well as maybe install racing harnesses like Pete and I shot that video on. So stay tuned for the next one, guys, and we will start putting this thing back together.